Welcome to Food for Thought, an award-winning podcast that explores and celebrates what it means to live a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. My name is Colleen patrick Goudreau. I am your host. You can find me at Colleen patrick Goudreau or joyfulvegan.com. You can find me on social media, especially Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And you can subscribe to Food for Thought at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, SoundCloud, and now Spotify, which is new and fantastic. You can follow Food for Thought on Spotify. And thank you for sharing this podcast, leaving ratings and reviews, and for supporting Food for Thought, which you can do at patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau, or you can just go to joyfulvegan.com. Today's episode is When Meat Corporations Buy Vegan Companies Selling Out or Buying In. Hi, everyone, and congratulations. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, dairy milk consumption has fallen 25% from 1996 to 2016. And just in the past five years, per capita consumption of cow's milk has dropped 13%, while in Europe it has fallen 4%. Tom Gallagher, Chief Executive of Dairy Management Incorporated, a national organization that promotes dairy products and is funded by dairy farmers, says these numbers are devastating. At some point, dairy milk could become an irrelevant beverage for the average consumer. According to new data from Innova Market Insights, the global plant milk market is anticipated to increase to a whopping 16.3 billion dollars in 2018, a huge increase from 2010 when it was just 7 billion dollars, and it's projected to rise to 21.7 billion by 2022. And it's not just liquid milk, we're talking about non-dairy ice creams and yogurts and creamers as well. Sales of non-dairy ice cream alone increased 44% in the last year, according to Nielsen, that market research firm, while dairy ice cream sales rose only 3%. And in a huge contrast to what was available to me when I first became vegan, plant-based cheeses are the fastest growing plant milk category with 31.4% growth in the natural channel and 18% growth in all channels for a total of $104 million in sales over the past year. All of this because of the public's growing awareness and concerns about saturated fat levels, lactose intolerance, hormone content, antibiotic use in dairy cows, as well as animal welfare, all thanks to vegan and animal advocates raising awareness and providing education and resources. Although growing at a slower rate than their plant-based dairy counterparts, sales of vegan meats, plant-based proteins, are also on the rise. According to data released by the Plant-Based Foods Association, total plant-based meat sales exceeded $606 million in sales in 2016. That's in the U.S., but you know, Germany is leading the way. In 2016, Germany launched more vegan food products than any other country. All of this, very exciting for the present, for the future, and for the animals. As a human being who cares about doing my share to not contribute to violence against animals, I became vegan almost 20 years ago. And since then, I have made a point to consciously and purposefully not purchase anything that comes off of or out of an animal. I made and I continue to make this choice because it's an extension of a reflection of a manifestation of my deepest values of compassion and kindness. Once I discovered what I was paying people to do for me, I didn't want to be part of it. I just couldn't pay to have animals hurt and killed on my behalf for my taste buds. And of course, there are millions of people like me who don't want to buy and consume products from a few industries that are responsible for bringing into this world billions of animals for the sole purpose of using them up and killing them. What follows then, it would seem, is the idea that I, you, all of us who are not buying animal products are having an impact on the meat, dairy, and egg industries, right? I mean, if we're not buying those products, surely we're hurting them financially, right? Well, of course, not buying meat, dairy, and eggs, and by extension, leather, wool, and fur, since I don't buy anything that comes off of an animal, certainly means the companies who sell such things don't have me and you and you and you as customers. But you know what? 
I might argue that there's an even more impactful way I'm hurting the animal product companies, a more powerful way they feel the impact of my not being one of their customers. And that is, I am the customer of companies who make vegan meats, milks, cheeses, ice creams, etc. Hence, the success of the manufacturers of these products. Hence, the disruption of the food industry as we know it. Hence, the meat, dairy, and egg industries no longer seeing vegan companies and the products they make as merely blips on the radar, but rather as competitors they should be afraid of, or as competitors they should emulate, learn from, or collaborate with. Hence, the buying into the success, the growth, and the future of the plant-based market. Hence, vegans who may feel confused or dismayed or betrayed when large multinational corporations, in some cases corporations whose business model has been the sale of animal flesh and fluids, purchase or invest in vegan companies. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I hope you'll listen. I hope you'll listen with an open heart and an open mind. You may not agree with everything I say. You may not agree with the perspectives of others I'm going to share, but I would encourage you to be open even to the things you may disagree with. Personally, I think we have forgotten how to disagree, which I think is detrimental. We live in such a divisive time and we have technologies that enable us to express our like never before. But that comes at a cost, and we're paying a high price for it, not only in terms of our relationships with one another, but also in terms of being critical thinkers. It's almost as if we think that to even entertain an opposing point of view is to invalidate our own and give credence to the other. Or we throw the baby out with the bathwater altogether, and we won't even listen to a viewpoint of someone who's in a different box than we've chosen to be in. If we're Republican, we don't want to listen to anything Democrats say. If we're progressive, we don't want to hear anything a conservative says. We live in our social media bubbles, often not even exposed to other viewpoints. And when we are, we unfriend them or delete them at the click of a button. We shut down the speech of someone we find offensive rather than formulating our best argument in response. And we live in an echo chamber surrounding ourselves with everyone who agrees with us, which I would argue is a dangerous thing. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. There's a conservative columnist at the New York Times named Brett Stevens, and I really appreciate a number of articles he's written. One is a brilliant piece based on a keynote speech he gave at a media awards dinner. It's called The Dying Art of Disagreement. And I encourage you to read the entire thing. I've included a link on my website for today's episode, but I want to share a little bit of it with you now to frame our conversation today. Stevens talks about the liberal arts education he received at the University of Chicago. As I think about it, he says, I'm not sure we were taught anything at all. What we did was read books that raised serious questions about the human condition and which invited us to attempt to ask serious questions of our own. Education in this sense wasn't a teaching with any fixed lesson. It was an exercise in interrogation to listen and understand, to question and disagree, to treat no proposition as sacred and no objection as impious, to be willing to entertain unpopular ideas ideas and cultivate the habits of an open mind. That's what I was encouraged to do by my teachers at the University of Chicago, which showed us that every great idea is really just a spectacular disagreement with some other great idea. Socrates quarrels with Homer, Aristotle quarrels with Plato, Locke quarrels with Hobbes, and Rousseau quarrels with them both. Nietzsche quarrels with everyone. Wittgenstein quarrels with himself. These quarrels are never personal, nor are they particularly political, at least in the ordinary sense of politics. Sometimes they take place over the distance of decades, even centuries. Most importantly, they're never based on a misunderstanding. On the contrary, the disagreements arise from perfect comprehension, from having chewed over the ideas of your intellectual opponent so thoroughly that you can properly spit them out. In other words, to disagree well, you must first understand well. You have to read deeply, listen carefully, watch closely. You need to grant your adversary moral respect, give him the intellectual benefit of doubt, have sympathy for his motives, and participate 
and participate empathetically with his line of reasoning. And you need to allow for the possibility that you might yet be persuaded of what he has to say. Intelligent disagreement is the lifeblood of any thriving society. Yet we in the United States are raising a younger generation who have never been taught either the how or the why of the disagreement, and who seem to think that free speech is a one-way right, namely their right to disinvite, shout down, or abuse anyone they dislike, lest they run the risk of listening to that person or even allowing someone else to listen. The results are evident in the parlous state of our universities and the frayed edges of our democracies. Can we do better? Yes, we disagree constantly, but what makes our disagreements so toxic is that we refuse to make eye contact with our opponents or try to see things as they might or find some middle ground. Instead, we fight each other from the safe distance of our separate islands of ideology and identity and listen intently to echoes of ourselves. We take exaggerated and histrionic offense to whatever is said about us. We banish entire lines of thought and attempt to excommunicate all manner of people without giving them so much as a cursory hearing. The crucial prerequisite of intelligent disagreement, namely shut up, listen up, pause and reconsider, and only then speak, is absent. And I encourage you, as I said, to read the entire piece. So with that, I'm framing today's topic. You know, I've seen the reactions of the news that various vegan companies have been purchased by various non-vegan companies. And these reactions range from hyperbole and untruths to vitriolic outrage and calls for boycotts to sadness and confusion to accusations that the vegan companies are selling out or that the people who don't think they're selling out are apologists for the meat industry and betrayers of the animals. I've seen a lot of misinformation out there about who owns who. So let's start with the facts. At the end of 2017, Field Roast, maker of vegan burgers, sausages, chow, cheese slices, and other grain-based meats was purchased by Canada's Maple Leaf Foods, a large meat company in Canada, for $120 million. This is the second vegan acquisition for the meat giant as it acquired plant-based meat brand Light Life, for $140 million in February 2017. ConAgra, by the way, had bought LightLife in 2000, but then a private equity investment firm bought LightLife from ConAgra, and then in 2017, Maple Leaf bought LightLife. Also in the fall of 2017, Daya, the company that makes vegan cheeses and cheesecakes, yogurts, and other plant-based foods, was bought by Atsuka, a Japanese pharmaceutical company, for over $300 million. Also in 2017, Nestle bought Sweet Earth, maker of vegan frozen meals, burritos, breakfast sandwiches, other plant-based proteins such as benevolent bacon and harmless ham. In 2016, going back, Beyond Meat sold a 5% stake of its business to Tyson Foods, the largest meat producer in the U.S., at the same time, Tyson launched a venture capital fund worth $150 million to invest in startups that develop plant-based meats. Going back even further, in November of 2014, Pinnacle Foods purchased Gardein, maker of plant-based proteins and frozen meats, for $154 million. And going all the way back to 2002, White Wave, the parent company of Silk, soy milk, was sold to Dean Foods, the largest dairy company in the United States for just under $300 million. In 2013, so moving forward, White Wave separated from Dean Foods and became an independent publicly traded company. And in 2014, White Wave acquired So Delicious, maker of non-dairy yogurts, milks, and ice creams for $195 million. In 2015, White Wave purchased vegan nutrition company Vega. And by then, White Wave had already purchased Alpro, um, a Belgian-based plant milk company. Then, by April 2017, the acquisition of White Wave by French dairy company Danone was complete, which paid $10.4 billion for White Wave. The newly formed company is Danone Wave. And so to be clear, Danone owns So Delicious, Silk, Vega, and Alpro, all makers of vegan products. 
As I said, I've seen many reactions to all of this. And of course, there are many perspectives. There's the perspective of the businesses that have built these companies of vegan products from the ground up. There's the perspective of the corporations and investors who purchase or invest in these smaller companies. There's the perspective of the vegans who've been the customers of the vegan companies. And there's the perspective of the non-vegans who've been the customers of these non-vegan companies, as well as these vegan companies. There There are many points of view, and though we might not agree with all of them, we need at least to understand them to better understand and formulate our own perspective. Now, I'm going to say something that some people might not like acknowledging. We live in a capitalist economic system based on, thank you, Merriam-Webster, the private ownership of goods and services characterized by the freedom of capitalists to operate and manage their property for profit in competitive conditions. Now, I'm not here to debate whether or not capitalism is a good thing. I'm just here to say that's our starting point. And Every single person who starts a company, runs a company, or buys and sells a company is part of this system, whether you're vegan, not vegan, ethical, not ethical. The purpose of the business is to generate profits from the products or services you're offering. Now, companies can certainly be values-based as well as profit-driven, and many are, but they're still companies, and the point is to generate profits. Now, companies can also not be values-driven, and many aren't, uh, and the point is still to generate profits, regardless of what it is they're making. On that note, I'm going to say something radical here. The companies who make money off the backs of animals would be happy to not make money off the backs of animals as long as they keep making money. Many corporations that sell animal flesh and fluids have been around for a long time and have been making billions of dollars off of animal suffering for just as long, but only because it's a model that's been profitable for them. My point is they're not committed to killing animals as much as they're committed to making money. And if they could make as much money not killing animals, then they'll do it. They're not committed to animal cruelty. They're committed to profits. But many companies selling animal flesh and secretions are realizing that A, their business model is outdated and archaic. B, that their business model has many risks. Outbreaks of zoonotic diseases and foodborne illnesses alone are a huge concern and a huge cost. And C, that their business model isn't sustainable in all senses of the word. The world's population is projected to reach close to 10 billion people by 2050. And there aren't anywhere near enough resources on the planet to support animal agriculture at that scale, even so-called sustainable animal agriculture, not a thing. As it stands, animal agriculture takes up about a third of the world's land and is responsible for 15% of greenhouse gas emissions, more than the entire transportation sector. Well, you say, just go vegan. The problem is the demand for animal flesh and secretions is outpacing people going vegan. And that demand is only increasing, not waning, which is why the growth of companies making vegan meat, dairy, and eggs and clean meat, dairy, and eggs, we're going to talk about that in another episode, is key. If the public can get the same texture and taste and flavor and salt and fat and familiarity from plant-based meat, dairy, and eggs, then that's what they'll choose. And therein lies our heroes, the purveyors of these products, the corporations who want to increase the sales of these products, and the consumers who justify their place in the market. We can all of us do this together. We can all of us face the same direction and make this happen faster. It's not unlike oil and gas companies investing in solar and wind and other renewable energies because they see the writing on the wall. This is not a fad. It's a shift. And it's one we can accelerate for the sake of our planet and all of its living beings. What major corporations, especially those whose main sales have been the flesh and fluids of animals, what they're realizing is that the sales growth and profit potential of plant-based products is now so significant that the risk of being involved in what was once just a small, unprofitable niche market is now lower than the risk 
of not being involved. They're seeing that ethical vegan companies are not only sustainable from a financial perspective, but also from an environmental one. That the public cares about corporate responsibility and that the potential profits are huge. Cynics may point out that they're just in it for the money. Realists may point out that they're just in it for the money. Either way, the end result is more and more companies and investors are looking at ways to make profits in a sustainable way. And what savvy, talented, hardworking, amazing vegan business owners have demonstrated is that there's money to be made in this market. And we as the customers and the purchasers of these products have proven that. And so the large corporations are sitting up, taking notice, and realizing they have to buy in to this market. Bill Gates has called plant-based meat the future of food. Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, has said that alternative proteins may well save the planet from climate change. Tom Hayes, the new CEO of Tyson Foods, one of the largest meat producers in the world, says he wants to move the company towards sustainability to feed the world's bloated population. A reporter asked him, you invested 5% in Beyond Meat, a plant-based meat company. Is that our future, do you think? Are people headed down the plant-based route? And Hayes replied, I think they are. If you look at the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization stats, protein consumption is growing around the world and it continues to grow. It's not just hot in the US, it's hot everywhere. People want protein. So whether it's animal-based protein or plant-based protein, they have an appetite for it. Plant-based protein is growing almost at this point faster than animal-based. So I think the migration may continue in that direction. The dairy industry is aware of this as well. They see their impending inevitable doom and it's terrifying to them. That's why they're throwing everything they can into the sinking lifeboat. Listen to my animology episode with Michelle Simon on the Dairy Pride Act. They know they can't compete with plant-based milks in terms of taste, in terms of nutrition, in terms of production costs, in terms of the inherent risks that come with a model based on living beings who need to be fed and bred and killed not to mention the waste they have to manage, no such factors in plant-based milk companies. And so companies who've relied solely on profits from animal flesh and fluids are now diversifying their portfolios. They're buying into the plant-based market. And what's the easiest, lowest risk, fastest way for them to do this? Acquiring the companies with a proven track record of success. Why? Because that's historically what large companies do. These large companies don't tend to be innovators or risk takers. By buying smaller innovative companies, they're hedging their bets. Because ask any of the vegan companies who built what they have from the ground up, it's hard to create good products like the ones we know and love. It's hard from a practical standpoint, from a research and development standpoint, from a branding and marketing standpoint, and it's expensive. By purchasing smaller, profitable companies, the larger companies can dip their toe into this market without much to lose. Most large companies are not risk takers. They play it safe, which is why so many of them feel so archaic. They're just doing the same thing again and again and again, but they're realizing that that's not sustainable. That's not going to last. The leaders of these corporations tend to be those who are really skilled in matters of finance, marketing, supply chain, production. They're not the disruptors. They're the ones who get disrupted. It's the startups that are the visionaries, the innovators, and the risk takers. And so one of the ways large corporations can foster innovation is by acquiring the smaller companies that have proven themselves to be skilled at all of the things that make them successful. They capitalize on new technologies. They anticipate market trends. They use their lean structures to outpace larger companies. That's significant. But being small has its liabilities, namely resources. The most pressing challenge for any company that wants to grow is how to finance that growth, especially growth in terms of purchasing raw materials, marketing, distribution, especially in terms of getting their products into an international marketplace. 
Though their innovations may be exactly what the marketplace needs and wants, they're likely to be handicapped in reaching it, says James Botkin and Jaina Matthews, authors of Winning Combinations, the coming wave of entrepreneurial partnerships between large and small companies. What they say is entrepreneurs and corporate executives now need each other more than ever. Their needs and their strengths are often opposite and complementary. Both large corporations and small companies can brighten their global prospects by forming collaborative partnerships that capitalize on their complementary strengths while respecting the independence of each party. This dilemma is a familiar one to every successful small business who wants to grow. You can either stay independent and have a big impact on a small scale, or you can take a risk and have a small impact on a large scale. And it's a very difficult decision, especially for visionaries who've invested not only their sweat, blood, and tears, not to mention their bank accounts, into this venture, but who have also invested their own mark, their own personality, their principles, their vision, their imagination, their creativity. The brand, the product is literally an extension of their vision. And it takes a lot of courage and strength and self-awareness and character to let that go and trust that what you've created will still be honored while it's being grown. Of course, it's a risk for any small company being courted by a larger one. I don't envy them that decision, but it's the risk of doing business, especially if you are looking towards its future and its growth. And some companies are willing to take the risk and some aren't. And of course, in weighing the risks and benefits, the smaller company recognizes that the larger company can make their product so much more successful. So, of course, in weighing these risks and benefits, the most obvious thing is the smaller company recognizes that the larger company can make their product, their beloved product that they have built from scratch, much more successful in a number of ways. Large manufacturers have access to numerous mainstream buying channels that the small manufacturers don't. The larger corporations often have larger distribution channels, uh, enabling the products to be sold in more stores, in more outlets, in more markets, in more restaurants. They can also purchase raw ingredients and manufacture or distribute with more economies of scale, making a product more affordable and more accessible to a wider range of consumers. Now we'll get to the perspective and benefits of the consumer in a moment, but one more thing to consider. Another benefit for the small business owner is that the resources they gain from the sale may enable them to start another vegan business. We saw that with Eve Potvan from Canada. He started Eve's Veggie Cuisine. Most of you have heard of Eve's. In 1985, for like $40,000 or something, he borrowed money from, you know, from family. He took out a small loan. He put his own money into it. And they created the world's first veggie dog. It was my first veggie dog. I remember it well. He made it a success and he sold the company in 2001 to Haynes Celestial Group in order to start Gardein which, as I said in the beginning, was sold to Pinnacle Foods for $154 million in 2014. Now, I, in the spirit of making sure we're being accurate when we react to things, I've seen people online saying that Gardein is owned by Tyson. It's not true. It's owned by Pinnacle Foods. A company called Hillshire Brands, which owns Jimmy Dean and Ballpark, as in the sausages and the hot dogs, was in the middle of buying Pinnacle. So Hill, Hillshire was in the middle of buying Pinnacle, But that deal fell through when Tyson wanted to buy Hillshire. So for the record, Tyson did buy Hillshire, uh, but Hillshire does not own Pinnacle. That deal fell through. Uh, Pinnacle owns Gardein, but Pinnacle is not owned by Tyson. Anyway, that's just an example of an entrepreneur making a successful plant-based product company that was then sold to enable him to start another. And by all accounts, Gardein, maker of delicious vegan meats, is a successful company. So the advantage for the large corporation is the acquisition of an already successful, profitable business that enables them to expand their offerings and sell to their existing customer base without a lot of risk. But I don't want to be glib about this. $100 million, $150, $200 million, $300 million, it's still a lot of money. These larger companies are throwing at what will become part of their corporation, often as a subsidiary. In the deal, they get 
good products as well as good people. That's often part of the deal. The smart, innovative people who made the vegan company a success often stay on to continue to run that company that's just now part of this larger company. So I said acquiring smaller companies is lower risk than starting their own line of vegan products, but it's not no risk. And it's for that reason that it's not in their best interest to alter the existing products and damage the trust that customers already have placed in them. In other words, I've seen vegans lament that this large company will now ruin the product or that the products won't be vegan anymore and that they're just going to undercut the vegan subsidiary to destroy the competition, Like none of which makes any sense from the perspective of anyone and everyone involved in the deal. Everyone wants the vegan line of products to succeed. It's not that there may not be changes to packaging and some branding, but you'll never see so many changes that it's going to alter the existing consumer's relationship to and recognition of the brand. And more than that, the small company can sometimes influence the larger company in terms of suppliers, also in terms of company culture. So for example, Field Roast outlined in a nine-point document its vegan commitment that Maple Foods is honoring that not only will all existing and future field roast products continue to be vegan, but they will only ever be produced in a vegan facility where no animal products will even be allowed in the staff break room with minor exceptions for for reheating something in a microwave. The company will maintain its vegan society certification status, only sponsor vegan events, ensure all sampling products and condiments at events are vegan, maintain a vegan social media presence, and source only vegan office materials and supplies while continuing to support causes that align with Field Roast's vegan mission. That all remains the same. Dea, same thing, said in a statement, we're not changing the way we create our foods and our companies will operate independently. Dea will always remain Dea, and we hope that all of our fans recognize that Dea will remain the brand our customers have come to trust. And that's really what it comes down to is trust. Trust and expansion of vegan products, which is a win-win for the animals, period. The larger company wants these products and subsidiaries to succeed. And to do so, they'll increase their exposure and distribution so that more people will buy them. I can't tell you how many times I have told people to buy a field roast product or other vegan products who couldn't find them in their supermarkets. That has everything to do with distribution. In order to grow, you need money to do so. Sure, they can take out more loans. Sure, they can get private equity and then be beholden to private shareholders who expect results right away. Sure, they can stay small and make sure that only some people have access to their products at a much higher cost. But not only am I not going to pretend to know or judge the inner workings of a small company and their financials and their stress and the risks they're taking on, I also don't want to be part of an exclusive group of people who have access to cruelty-free products. I want everyone to have access and at competitive lower prices that's possible only because of the economies of scale that larger companies have. It's literally not about me. And I'll be honest, it's not even about vegans. You know what it's about? I will tell you in a moment, but I first really want to thank you all for your support, uh, for listening, for subscribing to this podcast. You make all of it possible. Everyone who supports this work at $5, $10, $30, $100, $200 a month, and we have those supporters, I thank you. If you're already a supporter, please make sure your support is actually going through by going to patreon.com and making sure your credit card's updated. We didn't reach our goal this year. I was hoping to be able to reach our goal so that I could keep producing animology podcasts, but not having reached that goal, I can't. I'm hoping we can do that in the next year. So please go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau to become a supporter. But thank you to everyone who makes the hours of research, writing, recording, editing, engineering, hosting possible, including uh, Morgan Hall, David Cabrera, Alexander Gray, Michal Stone, Tim Anderson, Sylvie Raquel, and Auric. And remember, supporters at $10 and above receive written transcripts to every Food for Thought and Animology episode. So if you're getting anything out of this podcast, that podcast, my work in general, please consider becoming a supporter. Just visit patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. 
or go to joyfulvegan.com and click on the donate button. So it's not about me and it's not even about vegans. It's about reaching a much more diversified consumer base. And it's that base these larger companies want to reach. And frankly, who the smaller independent vegan companies are also reaching, it's not just vegans. Vegan restaurants, vegan food companies, the majority of their customers are non-vegetarians. They're not vegan. But if you want companies to sell only to vegans, I don't know what to say to that. I've seen vegans complain that these big corporations are just trying to make money off of vegans. Well, I hate to tell you this, but so are the small companies. Even the independent vegan ones we know and love, they're successful if you buy their stuff. They survive because they're making money off of vegans and non-vegans. But you know what? A, there's nothing wrong with that at all. B, I'm thrilled larger corporations and investors recognize that vegan businesses are viable, profitable ventures to collaborate with and partner with and invest in and sometimes acquire. We want cruelty-free, animal-free products to dominate the marketplace, don't we? And C, These companies you think are just getting into the vegan marketplace so they can make money off of vegans. Heck, if that were their business plan, they'd be pretty poor business people. If it makes you feel any better, they actually care less about vegans than they do about everybody else. Sure, they're happy to take our money. Uh, Any company selling something is. But when they look at consumer trends, they see that vegan products are succeeding in attracting a much wider consumer base, those who call themselves flexitarians or reducitarians. David Sprinkle, research director for Packaged Facts, says that vegetarians and vegans together account for less than 15% of all consumers and that their numbers don't grow very rapidly. But a growing number of consumers identify themselves as flexitarian or lessitarian, meaning they've cut back on their consumption of animal-based foods and beverages. It's this group that is most responsible for the significant and ongoing shift, for example, from dairy milk to plant-based milk. Demand is also spurred by the growing interest in both free from and organic qualities, which are commonly represented by vegan products, end quote. And so because of the success of these smaller companies, The larger companies can target people who, for whatever reason, are limiting or eliminating their consumption of animal flesh and fluids. What these companies have come to recognize is that meat eaters are finding satisfaction in these amazing plant-based proteins. And that's really where the focus is now on proteins. And that's a good thing because the focus isn't on animal flesh or animal protein, it's protein. And if people can get the same fat, salt, texture, satisfaction, and familiarity from a plant protein without missing anything at all, then that's a win. It's kind of like what I said about the corporations being less interested in killing animals than they are about making money. It's the same for consumers. They're not drooling over the fact that animals were tortured and killed for their burger. They're drooling over the fat and salt and flavor and texture and familiarity that they've become accustomed to. It's It's that they crave, not animal abuse. But they're also not necessarily becoming vegan entirely yet. In other words, the non-vegetarians and the non-vegans aren't coming from a place of ethical purity, which is fine because when they're choosing a cruelty-free vegan product, it means they're not choosing a violently procured animal product, and that's a good thing. When we call for boycotts of companies like Field Roast and Dea because of our own ideology, we're sending the message that we'd rather hinder the growth of these products in the marketplace, keep the prices high and hinder the availability to customers who aren't driven by that same ideology. But you might say, if vegans aren't the main customer base, if these corporations know that the majority of their customers are non-vegans, then they won't miss me if I'm not buying their products, if I'm not their customer, if I boycott them on principle. Well, sure, 
okay, you're welcome to buy from whomever you want, whatever company you want. That's the beauty of a free market. And I mean it. You don't have to buy any of these products ever again, but maybe not create a crusade against them because it sure sends a confusing message to the non-vegans who think they're doing the right thing by not buying an animal product. I'm remembering my mother's boyfriend coming to me and saying, hey, I bought all this Morning Star stuff, the sausages and burgers and whatever they were. He said, pretty good. I like them. They're pretty good. Imagine if I said, oh, yeah, I'm boycotting them because they're owned by a multinational corporation that also sells animal products. He, what I, can I, should I, I don't know, but what, like, what is he supposed to do with that? Like, should I not buy them then? Like, I, imagine a family member or a coworker or a friend coming up to us with enthusiasm, maybe even reluctant enthusiasm saying, okay, you're winning me over. Not entirely. I'm not vegan yet, but I did try the vegan cheese at my local pizza restaurant and it was really good. And we say, was it Dea? And they say, yeah, I really liked it. And we say, yeah, um... That's great, but they were bought by a Japanese pharmaceutical company, which by law uh, has to test on animals for their drugs. So I don't know. I mean, what are we actually asking of them? Do we really want to discourage them in trying these products? I mean, is that what we really want? We want to hinder the sales of vegan products made by vegan companies who are subsidiaries owned by meat corporations who are literally trying to make money from vegan products. Don't we want these companies to become 100% vegan? You think the way they're going to do that is to just abandon their companies and walk away on principle because of global warming? That's not how the real world works. Surveys show that convenience and cost are two of the biggest factors in food choices for people, not purity or ideology. Whether it matters to us or not, people don't want to be seen as different and they don't want to have to work that hard to find food. It has to be easy. It has to be convenient. It has to be familiar and affordable. If there are barriers when it comes to choosing vegan foods, they're going to pick the animal products every single time. So for anyone doing vegan education and outreach who's encouraging people to become vegan? Don't we want to make it easy for them to find the vegan products? And if one of the ways to make it possible is to point them to the vegan products that are owned by larger companies, even if they're meat companies, isn't that better than not being able to tell them about vegan products? Isn't that better than them defaulting to animal flesh and fluids? People don't aspire to purity and ideology when they're hungry. They aspire to food. And if it can be made easy for them, then that's what we need to do to make it easier for them. Now, that's not to say that I don't encourage people to cook at home. That's what I do. I I encourage people to cook at home and make their own meals and make their own products, if you will, right? Their own milk, their own sausages. But nobody does that 100% of the time. I will always encourage people to make their own veggie burgers or almond milk or sausages. But A... I don't even do this 100% of the time. And B, it's pretty awesome to be able to buy the products to help me cook at home. I mean, like, should I churn my own vegan butter? Like, should I create my own vegan cheeses from my own vegan (laughs) plant-based milks? Like, perfect my own seitan? Okay, I have perfected my own seitan. But the point is, I... Don't expect that level of perfection in myself. Why would I ask it of someone else, especially someone to whom all of this is new and overwhelming? The bottom line is the more vegan products, the better. Whether they're made by small companies, large companies, subsidiary companies, independent companies, veteran companies, or new companies. Every purchase of these products is a vote for them in the marketplace. Manufacturers track consumer purchases very carefully. And if the vegan ones are getting lots of votes, i.e. sales, corporations will not only continue to produce them, but will expand these lines by investing in them further. The more successful the vegan arms of these larger companies are, the more they will lower the manufacturing of the animal-based products. It's happening. We just happen to be in this unprecedented time where we're seeing the growth of plant foods and the beginnings of the demise of animal products, but we're in the transition and transitions are messy. They're not perfect, but it's all a sign of the times and it's a sign of what's to come. Now, I want to be clear, of course, the independently owned vegan companies deserve our support as well. And there are many wonderful companies out there, but I just don't think it has to be either 
or. There's room for everyone. And that's what's so exciting. We have so many choices and those choices are only going to grow and become more affordable and ecumenical. And let's be honest, when you step back and look at the big picture, the truth is the success of one vegan company means the success of another. The success of the larger vegan brands contributes to the success of the smaller ones. Silk Soy Milk is a great example of this. Before Silk was large and hugely profitable, soy milks weren't even on most people's radar. The larger and more successful Silk became, due in no small part to the hard work of its founders, even after the sale to Dean Foods, the more it created opportunities for other plant milk companies. Today, the plant milk industry is destroying the dairy industry, threatening its very existence, its very future. And I think an argument could be made that all of the other plant milk companies that came along since and that are coming along still were and are able to do so because of the foundation that was laid by Silk by White Wave. In other words, the success of the small independently owned vegan companies is due not only to their fabulous products and awesome branding and strong leadership and good management and sound business practices and financial decisions, it's also due to the success of the larger ones, including the once independent companies that got acquired by larger corporations. That is to say, the smaller companies, the independent companies also get a boost when larger brands get more capital and exposure. And that's what's wonderful is that we have the option to support any and all, and we should support them all. But I would also encourage us not to put one company on a pedestal for not making a decision that another company decided to make. I would encourage us to not make saints of one company for not making a business decision that another company has made and a sinner out of one company for making a business decision that another company hasn't. None of these companies are philanthropic organizations. As much as they've infused their compassionate values into their businesses, in the end, their businesses that make vegan products, and I'm so grateful to them, but they don't owe me anything. They're beholden only to their employees and their staff. They're not beholden to me or my principles or my values. But I get it. The companies we know and love, Follow Your Heart, Tofurky, Field Roast, Miyoko, Gardein, Earth Balance, Beyond Meat, we feel an affinity to them. We feel we have a relationship with them. We feel we've been loyal to them and we think we deserve the same loyalty. I've seen people write, how could they do this to me, right? Or X company, don't ever do this to me. Don't ever, don't ever do this to me. As if it's a personal affront. It's not. It's a business decision and there's nothing immoral about that. These companies are still vegan with vegan principles making vegan products. They're not the enemy. They're still vegan and vegans who defend them are still vegan. They're not apologists for the meat, dairy, and egg companies or fake vegans. Accusations I've seen hurled at people who defend companies like Field Roast and Daya. They're not real vegans, their attackers contend. They're fake vegans. Whatever the heck on God's green earth that means. I, I honestly don't even know what that means. There aren't fake vegans and real vegans. We're all just trying to do the best we can to not hurt anyone. We live in an imperfect world that's full of compromise and crappy realities. I'm thrilled Ben & Jerry's has a line of delicious vegan ice creams, even though they still have a huge successful line of non-vegan ice creams. I'm thrilled that Pizza Hut will be offering vegan Violife cheese as an option at all of the chain restaurants. Remember the story I told about us in Florida trying to find a, an edible meal? like, And we went to Pizza Hut and I had to threaten like that I was going to die if I didn't have like a non-cheese pizza. I mean, now Violet cheese is going to be all at all Pizza Hut uh, restaurants, even though Pizza Hut will still be serving animal products. I order vegan options at non-vegan restaurants. I dine at vegan restaurants whose owners aren't vegan. I buy vegan products at mainstream non-vegan supermarkets. I buy non-leather shoes from leather shoe companies. I buy vegetables from farmers that invariably use animal products as fertilizers. And I'm no less vegan because of it. My broccoli is no less a plant because of it. Imperfect? Yes. Animal byproducts like leather and 
and animal fertilizer exist because of how prevalent animal waste is in the slaughter industry. If we didn't kill so many animals for primary products, we wouldn't have so much waste from the animals to use as byproducts. That's the reality. The reality is a world where we artificially reproduce billions of animals only to kill them, where the very existence of these billions contribute to the world's most pressing environmental problems, including global warming, deforestation, air pollution, water pollution, soil degradation, and loss of biodiversity. The reality is where a third of the landmass is taken up by these animals and by the crops needed to keep these animals alive until the time they're slaughtered, where the price of grains and legumes grown for human consumption is so high that people are dying from hunger because croplands are used to grow cheap food for animals who will be slaughtered rather than for people to live. The reality is a world where healthy people are dying from preventable diseases caused by the consumption of animal flesh and fluids, where each and every one of these thinking, feeling animals is subjected to extreme confinement, painful mutilations, dismemberment, emotional trauma, violent slaughter every moment, every day. The reality is a world population growing so quickly to almost 10 billion in just 30 more years and where the demand for animal protein is growing with it. The reality is also the fact that we have new advancements, new technologies, and innovative and delicious plant-based products, and subsequently and hopefully clean meats that satisfy that growing population, but that don't have the detrimental impacts of the animal agriculture industry. The reality is that we have animal-based meat, dairy, and egg companies that see their future inventory filled with plant-based meat, dairy, and egg products. The reality is that in order to replace that inventory, it takes time to create, produce, test, get approved, package, distribute, market, and sell these products to eager consumers. The reality is that there are vegan companies who already did this, who do the hard work to make it possible for others, including the animal-based meat, dairy, and egg companies, to get pointed in the right direction without having to start from scratch. Thank you and congratulations to all of these individuals investors and visionaries, vegan and non-vegan, for building and growing this profitable, compassionate paradigm. And thank you and congratulations to all of the consumers, vegan and non-vegan, who've demonstrated that there's money to be made by not hurting anyone. And the ones who benefit the most are the animals, for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick-Bedreau. Thank you for listening.